Welcome everybody to our third Garden for Wildlife webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. We have almost 200 of you with us today. My name is Emily Vandermeer and I'm a member of WWF Canada's Nature Connected Communities team. And I'm joined today by Ryan Godfrey. You may remember him from our last two webinars. He is our resident botanist and he's also on the board of the North American Native Plant Society. And today he is gonna be telling us how we can grow and connect habitat for wildlife in small spaces, whether that's our backyard, our porches, or rooftops. So Ryan, what is the most common question you get asked about gardening in small spaces? Well, thanks, Emily. Um, I would say the number one question is, will my plants survive over winter? And that's a great question and one that I will be answering later in this webinar. Awesome. Thank you so much. And before we dig in, I just wanted to remind everybody that our Garden for Wildlife webinar series is ongoing. We have three more episodes coming up. On Saturday, we'll be talking about how you can maintain your garden year round and help wildlife through the seasons. And you can register for those on our website. You just go to wwf.ca and you'll see Garden for Wildlife on our homepage. And if you missed our past episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So I've left the um, link down below, just youtube.com slash WWF Canada, and you will find a playlist for Garden for Wildlife. And I'd also like to just give a special thanks to our partners. WWF Canada has been working with Carolini in Canada the past few years on a program called In the Zone Gardens. This is a really awesome program. It brings together thousands of gardeners from across Southern Ontario's Carolinian Zone to help grow Canada's largest wildlife garden. And this is especially important in Southern Ontario where there are so many species at risk. And I'd also like to just extend a big thank you to Loblaw who has been a champion of this program. And so today, what we're going to do, Ryan is gonna walk you through all of this information on your container gardens, and then he is going to go live from his balcony to do a demo container garden planting. So it's gonna be really cool. You're gonna see firsthand from his camera. And after that, there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions. So you'll notice a QA and a bar um, where you can just type those in and we'll be sure to get to those um, at the end of the presentation. So Ryan, I'm gonna pass this over to you. All right, thanks very much, Emily. Yeah, so here's what we're going to do. We'll start with a bit of context setting and background so we can all get into the right mindset of why we're talking about native plants and habitat in the context of a container garden. Um, then we're gonna do a quick overview of assessing our garden conditions, which is of course important for any kind of garden, but definitely for a container garden as well. I'll go through some of the materials that I use on a day-to-day -day basis um, that make my life a lot easier when I'm doing my gardening. And then finally, uh, I'm not a landscape designer or architect by any means, but I do have some thoughts on design that I thought I would impart to you before we go outside for our live demo. All right, next slide, please. So, first to start off, I always like to start with some definitions to get ourselves all in the right mindset. So to begin with, a garden is to me, is any place where plants grow and people care for them. So it's a pretty broad definition and can certainly include a balcony. Next, we have ecology, the study of the relationships between living organisms and with their non-living environment, okay? Ecological restoration is assisting in the recovery of degraded or destroyed ecosystems for the benefit of both humans and nature. And stewardship is the responsible use and protection of the natural environment through conservation and sustainable practices. Native plants, I get this question all the time, it bears repeating. These are the regional flora, which have evolved in your location for thousands of years. They are adapted to your local conditions and co-evolved with other organisms. And there's really no replacement for these when it comes to restoring nature. I'll get to that a little bit later too. 
Next up, we have habitat. That's any area that contains the features essential for the life cycle needs of a particular organism. And you can certainly set that up on your balcony. And last but not least, a botanist is an expert or a student in the study of plants, AKA plant nerd. And just to make the distinction, um, a horticulturist is someone who specializes in growing and caring for plants. And although that's not my profession, it is something that I've been doing for many years now. And uh, I'm happy to teach you what I've learned. But in the meantime, you know, being a botanist, being a horticulturist, everybody's got to start somewhere and might as well start now. Why not? All right, next slide, please. Okay. Talking about the context, why are we here talking about native plants? Well, at WWF, we have this context about the, the linkage between these two crises, climate change and biodiversity loss. So in ecology, everything is linked. And in the case of these two phenomena, unfortunately, what that means is that when one advances, the other one also advances in lockstep. Um, what it also means is that there are certain solutions, and we call those nature-based solutions, which benefit both biodiversity loss and climate change at the same time. Essentially, these are solutions that protect and maintain and restore natural carbon sinks, which are also habitat for wildlife. And, you know, that's, in large part, that's plants. Um, of, it's also soil, it's also water and air are all important parts of that, but plants make up a really big part of nature-based solutions. Next slide, please. I would be remiss in, uh, if I forgot to mention that we're in the middle of a pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic, of course. Um, and I like to highlight this quote from Emma Gilchrist in the Narwhal, who mentions way back at the beginning of this pandemic, seems like eons ago, that um, community scale solutions are going to become ever more necessary. She notes that gardens, family, friends, neighbors will be important as the pandemic spreads. And that this is a time when we can take stock of where we're at and where we want to go and maybe make some changes to our philosophy. I certainly agree with Emma on that. Next slide, please. So here is our challenge. Um, right here in southern Ontario, this squiggly line denotes the northern boundary of the Carolinian zone, which is Canada's most biodiverse region, and also the region with more species at risk than anywhere else in the country. You can see in this map that about 15% of it is covered by green, which marks functioning ecosystems, healthy landscapes, and most of these are protected areas, with the exception of some indigenous communities, for example. Um, and 15% is about where the rest of Canada is at too. And what we know from ecological science is that we actually need to be up near 30% or higher in order to realize those nature-based solutions of, um, of having nature around. So in the Carolinian zone, because most of this is private land, we recognize that although these um, protected areas are vitally important, they're not enough to get us to where we need to go. So we have to restore and enhance habitats across all land use types. That includes in residential areas, it includes on balconies. Next slide, please. The way we're gonna do this is by harnessing the learnings of ecology. Um, this is a complicated science because everything in ecology, as I mentioned before, is linked through patterns that are cyclical and web-like and layered on top of each other all at once. So it's a lot to, to grasp and to hold in your mind, but I'm going to condense down everything you need to know about ecology and ecological restoration into just two words. Ready? Native plants. That's it. You just take the native plants, you put them in the ground, and everything gets better. That's, that is ecological restoration in a nutshell. Next slide, please. So here's what it typically looks like. This is a restored marsh um, called Rattray Marsh in Mississauga, Ontario. So this looks like a totally natural space, but it's actually been restored by people. So humans came in 
removed invasive species, planted native species, stabilized the watercourse edges, um, created habitat for specific species, and are continuing to continually maintain this habitat. So um, that is what ecological restoration typically looks like, and we can definitely do that. Next slide, please. When we start to get into the human dominated landscape, we see some, some features like this. Now we've got vehicles, we've got high rises, we've got some, some structures. This is when ecologists usually start to go, eh, that's not really my job, that's not what I do for a living, but we do have to restore these spaces. And there are agencies, for example, the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority here in the Don Valley, um, that are doing ecological restoration. It, the principle is still the same, put in native plants, take out non-native plants. Um, the techniques are a little bit different, the challenges are slightly different, but we can still do this. Next slide, please. Now we move into an alien landscape, otherwise known as Toronto's downtown financial district. This photo was taken during Earth Hour, which is why things are a little dimmer than usual, but I think you'd be hard pressed to find any native plants in this photograph whatsoever. And maybe that shouldn't be the case. Maybe we should start thinking about how all of our spaces can be ecological spaces. How would we get native plants in here? How would we create habitat, viable habitat for lots of different wildlife species in a space like this. This is the kind of mindset that I want people to get into. It's a challenge that I pose to you. Next slide, please. So how are we going to know when we get there, when we get to a real functioning ecosystem? And also, why should we care in the first place? So to me, there's three reasons. The first is biodiversity. Of course, these are all of those wonderful plant and animal and insect species that we care so much about and that we don't want to go extinct. So a functioning ecosystem should support lots and lots of different species of wildlife. That's number one, but it's not all there is. We've also got ecosystem services. These are the things that we get out of nature and a functioning ecosystem that actually have a dollar value associated with them. So a simple one to think about is food. Um, you could also think about a tree that provides shade for your building so you don't have to spend money on air conditioning. Going a little bit broader, you could think about um, <clears throat> a forest, an urban ecosystem that filters the air and the water. That's something that is, has a cash value associated with it that otherwise we'd have to do with some kind of filtration plant. And then um, you can also think about human well-being and mental health, which have a dollar value associated with them as well. Finally, connectivity is a really important concept in ecology, as individual habitat patches need to be connected to each other in order to function. But in the human-dominated landscape, ecology has a connective capacity to sort of join people and neighbors and communities uh, all together for the shared interest in wildlife. So it's, it's kind of a cool cross-cultural feature there. And finally, what this all sort of boils down to is when you have a green space, you should be asking yourself, what does that green space do? How much biodiversity is it supporting? Lots of species or only a few? How many ecosystem services are you getting at this? Is it just one layer or many? And who is connecting with this garden space? Is it just a few people or is it being shared broadly? The answer should be lots and lots and lots of things are going on all at once. Um, and if it's not, then I challenge you to think deeper about how your garden or green space can do all of these things. Next slide, please. So this is just to summarize all of the wonderful things that your green space can do. And yes, even including your balcony. Um, and I know that maybe for a balcony or a small space, it seems like, uh, like it's not going to be very significant overall um, compared to someone who has a gigantic uh, farm field that they're, where they're going to plant thousands of trees. And although it may be true that a balcony garden is not going to win awards for most carbon sequestered, um, it does still matter because people will interact with your balcony when you take pictures of it and share them on social media, as I do very often, 
or when you talk about your garden or when you share seeds with people. It's changing people's mindset about what an urban space can be. And so it's still very, very important. So let's go to the next slide, please. Containers, okay. So why, why grow in containers? <laughs> Um, the answer for me is because I didn't have any other place to grow. And I think that's true for a lot of other people going back really, really far. So we have here in this top left here is an illustration of what people think the hanging gardens of Babylon may have looked like thousands of years ago. And uh, of course, this was, you know, you could, you could say that this was a myth, but I'm sure it didn't come out of absolutely nowhere. The concept must have been floating around that it's possible to, to grow plants in an urban space. Um, and in so doing, you can bring food nearby, greenery, and wildlife too. Um, of course, bonsai, here's another example, is, is another fascinating way that you could grow trees indoors. Um, and of course, the, the, the Japanese culture became very fascinated with this and, and are experts at creating these little miniature natural scenes in a pot. Um, here in the bottom left is an example of a succulent container that I built when I sort of recreated um, a desert habitat in my home and I'm able to grow lots and lots of different plants that um, thrive and flower and reproduce in this little container. Um, and finally, here on the right, I wanted to show you, um, this is St. Leonard's by the Sea, where I had a chance to visit um, last year. And I noticed that they didn't have a whole lot of soil because they live right on the, the um, shore, but they had all these paved areas with containers everywhere and vines growing up. And there were plants just, just about in every space that I could see. And I thought it was so cool that together as a community, the folks in this um, area had decided that they're gonna grow plants anyways in containers, even if they don't have any soil. So those are all different reasons that you can, that you can do this. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so let's talk about assessing conditions. This is critically important. Um, and we'll do this again, when we go outside, I'll go over this with you. But I wanted to share with you here, something that I did that is kind of cool and that anyone, whether you have a balcony space or just any kind of outdoor garden space, you can and probably should do this. So this is called a light diagram. And what I did here is this was last year, April 28th. I went outside and recorded the first time that light um, shone on my balcony. So I have a west facing balcony. So that didn't happen until the afternoon. And then in increments of two hours at one o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock, and seven o'clock, I came out and drew the path of the light. And so you can see, you know, the first light came in this way, and then I had arrows going sort of this way, and then they came in this way, and where they overlap, you can see the, the brightest area. So by the end of the day, I had figured out that at that time of year in early spring, um, this little wedge shape here is getting the most light between four and six hours, whereas this section here is only getting between two to four hours. And this section over here in the corner gets um, less than two hours of sun per day. And that puts me, by the way, in the realm of full shade to just on the bottom end of sunny conditions. Um, and that, that matches out with the type of plants that I've been able to grow on my balcony too. Um, and then down here, I just wanted to show you, um, I played around with some ideas of putting shade cloth up on my balcony to create an even shadier condition and also to block some wind. And so I, I was able to, based on this original diagram, figure out if I put sh shade on the south side, I would get this kind of pattern. And if I put it on the north side, I would get this kind of pattern. Um, so just some cool things that you can do. Next slide, please. Um, these are the materials that I use on a daily basis. Uh, you don't need to go quite this far, but I find all of these things really, really useful. So in the summertime, you will need to water your containers and I use a hose that I hook up to my kitchen sink. I run it outside and that way I can water stuff really easily without going back and forth, back and forth with the um, watering can. Although, of course, you can do a watering can as well. Um, I'll tell you more about the containers that I use when we go outside. Um, 
my garden knife is invaluable for um, cutting plants in half if I want to separate them or just digging a hole. Uh, my secateurs are great for chopping um, dried uh, plant material from last year, if that's something that I'm trying to do, um, or pruning as well. I use these little tools that I know they kind of look like kids tools for a sandbox, but I have to say they work really well in my little containers and oh, I don't know what I would do with a giant shovel up here anyway. Um, so zip ties and or or I use hemp twine sometimes to make a trellis or something like that. Bamboo rods, oh my gosh, I'll show you what I do with my bamboo rods. Um, and then I'll tell you a bit about tarps and mulch when we get into year round maintenance. So next slide, please. All right, so figuring out the right plants was a big challenge for me. Over the course of five years, I've learned that I can grow some things and I can't grow other things. Um, and sort of at first there was a bit of trial and error. I was just kind of trying to grow all the native plants that I could and some of them were not working, but I figured out that there was a pattern that some the plants that were doing well were those that grow in shallow soil ecosystems. Um, so the first one that I really noticed was wild columbine. And I looked up the ecology of where does wild columbine live? And it turns out it lives on cliffs, okay? And then it sort of slowly dawned on me over the course of like three years that, oh, I live on a cliff. My balcony is a ledge on the edge of a stone cliff, essentially. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense that wild columbine would grow there. Um, there are other shallow soil ecosystems that I've visited right here in Ontario, including shorelines. Here's a, a lovely camas lily growing in a crack right on the shoreline. Alvars, which are these fascinating ecosystems that sometimes they look like a parking lot. There's just pavement going straight across with cracks in them and plants growing in the little cracks. Sometimes you get soil, like in this picture, up to um, 15 or 30 centimeters deep and plants growing in there as well that are specialized to very, very shallow soil ecosystems. And both of these would be suitable for um, a sunny balcony, um, south facing or getting approaching six hours of light per day. Next slide shows some ecosystems that get less light. So a shallow forest, for example, like I've seen up on the Bruce Peninsula, there are tons and tons. This is an incredibly biodiverse ecosystem that's living on like this much soil, including there's huge sugar maples and beech, and they're just um, not bothered by the fact that there's not a whole lot of soil there. So what a great system to take um, inspiration from in building a container garden. And then here we have 16 Mile Creek in Oakville um, with its clay bluffs um, off, the, off to the side of the the water course here and you can see there are plants growing in here and up at the tops that are able to withstand this intensely eroded um, environment and, and still persist and grow and flower and all of that. So another great uh, place to draw inspiration from. Next slide please. So those are the types of plants in terms of ecosystems but then there's also the philosophy of now, how do I know that I'm getting a really legitimate native plant? Because when you go to the garden center, you may see plants that are labeled with the word native, or they might be labeled as wildflowers or, um, or pollinator plants, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's your best choice. Um, what you really need to know is, is the species native to your region? So is it in part of your local flora? but also is the source local? So was it sourced from nearby or were those original source populations quite far away? If they were from Florida or California or even, even um, Michigan or Virginia, those plants may not behave the same way as Ontario local sourced plants. Um, genetic diversity is incredibly important. Is it the case that each of these plants was grown by seed or are some of them being grown by propagating cuttings, which means they're essentially clones, um, which is not great for um, adaptation and evolutionary purposes. Are these plants domesticated, meaning have they been selected for particular traits that look pretty to us, but are actually not a benefit to wildlife, okay? Of course, are the plants pesticide free? If, they're, if they've been sprayed with pesticides, they're not gonna do their job in supporting insects. 
And finally, were they collected ethically or uh, did someone just sort of go out into the wild and dig up a rare plant and in so doing actually harm those natural populations? So these are all really important questions and you might not always be able to get answers to these at the garden center. Um, I'm happy to announce though that In the Zone has partnered with local growers um, and distributors to produce this garden sign, this, this plant tag. And if you see this tag in the plant, in the pot at the retailer, you know for sure that all of these criteria are being met. We've gone to great lengths to ensure that we're partnering with only the highest quality native plant sources. Next slide, please. Okay, maintenance. So I had an opportunity um, to partner with some colleagues that work on a, a program called Living Planet at Campus, which really focuses on things that students um, at post-secondary institutions, what can they do to um, help nature thrive? And we thought, well, container gardens, why can't they grow container gardens? Um, and so we, we asked them questions, we figured out what their barriers were, and then we put together a little guide for them. So it's really a step-by-step -step thing that's similar to what I'm saying today, but if you'd like to see that, we can link to that um, after the webinar, certainly. And part of that that I wanted to share with you right now is this wheel diagram that I adapted from our Four Seasons of Wildlife Gardening Guide. And this one is, is tailored specifically towards containers. So I'll just go through it really quickly now. Um, but you can read more about it in this resource afterwards. So winter and spring, you will need to be thinking about protection. And I'll show you some methods for doing that. But really what I found above all, the best way to protect your plants is to plant them in big containers so that their soil um, has a high heat capacity and it's not, it's not going up and down, up and down in temperatures. Fertilization is important. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we talk about soils outside. Um, in the summertime, you will need to water, as I said. That hose, I've got to tell you, uh, it comes in handy. <laughs> um, weeding, I do actually need to do a little bit of weeding in my containers, but I always leave little seedlings alone until I know exactly what they are, because I've also gotten free bonus native plants that show up in my containers sometimes, and what a tragedy that it would be if I accidentally pulled those, um, thinking they were weeds. Fall is my favorite time. Um, in the balcony because my plants are still flowering. I'm still getting pollinators. The temperature is cooling down to a nice um, degree. And I get to collect and scatter seeds, which is one of my favorite things to do. And I also like to steal um, yard waste containers from the side of the road so that I can put a little bit of leaf mulch into each of my containers to, uh, to help protect over winter again. All right, next slide, please. <coughs> going to wrap this stuff up and then we'll get outside. So a little bit on design. Um, one of the first things that I looked up when I got into container gardening was um, some of these horticulture guides that had this term of including spillers, fillers, and thrillers in your containers. I love that. It, it works. It sticks in your head. So consider that for native plants, the spillers are really um, vines and also plants in the pea family that will sort of crawl over your containers. Um, fillers and thrillers, upon more thought, I decided I don't like that terminology because it implies that some plants are just there to fill space, which is not true. They're there, they're special, they're important, they're beautiful in their own right. So I've now decided to split this into basically shorter plants, and taller plants, and it's nice to have both so that you have a bit of variability. Um, Bloom time is a really important thing to think about when you're planning your container garden. Here in Southern Ontario, and I would say across most of Canada, the majority of plants bloom between June and September. So if you've got a diversity of species, you probably will have that season covered. So focus on finding some plants that bloom early. So strawberries, violets, prairie smoke, um, those are great early blooming species. You'll see my prairie smoke is in bloom right now. Um, and in the fall, oh my goodness, if you're not growing asters and goldenrods, you're really missing out on like two entire months of beautiful flower displays. And you really, really should get in on that as soon as possible. 
Um, leaf shape and texture is an important thing to consider. I have a pretty windy balcony, so I found that broad-leaved plants and thin-leaved plants don't do as well as plants with um, featherier or more fern-like leaves or plants with tougher, waxy, or hairy leaves. Those tend to do better, but again, it's nice to have variation in there. Um, aroma is a big thing for me. I love smelling my plants and touching them, so I put lots and lots of different smelly plants in my containers, including New England aster, sweet grass, Virginia mountain mint, nodding wild onion, some of the giant hyssops. I personally like yellow giant hyssop, which has a, a milder aroma, and maybe even white cedar. I, I might go for that this year. I might, I might give it a try. Why not? Um, and then finally, the, I wanted to mention that in, when thinking about design and aesthetics, a lot of people tend to focus on color, pops of color, beautiful things, um, pretty things. But I, I want to just draw people's attention to don't forget that, yes, of course, uh, a summer dress covered in a beautiful pattern is a beautiful thing, but also a well-tailored suit is a beautiful thing that maybe isn't quite as the same of a pop of color, but it's, it's an aesthetic that can be admired. And to me, um, in, a, in any kind of garden, the grasses, sedges, rushes, and the ferns are really um, encapsulating that handsome quality. And I think every garden should have them. And if you don't, you're missing up. Next slide, please. I think we're getting close to, oh yeah, so I just, this is just to show you that my balcony garden ended up spilling out into the condo grounds. Um, so I got onto the, um, the condo board, um, the landscaping committee, and I convinced them to plant about 500 native species in our little courtyard, which is just outside, um, and our raised beds over here. And they're, I'm happy to announce, it's been a full year since they've been in the ground and they're coming up wonderfully um, and they attract a ton of pollinators. I had my first monarch butterfly on the condo premises um, last year when while this boulevard was blooming. Uh, next slide please. So with that let us do a little bit more polling and then in the meantime I'm going to get set up outside. All right. Okay, great, Ryan. Um, he's gonna go set up on his balcony. So just put out a poll here to see how many of you think that it's possible to grow your native plants indoors. Ryan talked about how he's growing his on his balcony, but what if you don't even have a balcony? Or your balcony is up too high? Okay, interesting seeing all of the results come in. So far, most of you are leaning towards, yes, it is possible to grow your native plants indoors. So I'll just give you all a couple more seconds to put in your answers and then we will reveal the truth about growing your native plants inside. Okay. So we had 58% of you think that you can, 38% don't know and 5% think that it's not possible. So Ryan, weigh in please. <laughs> Uh, okay, can you still hear me? Um, the correct answer is not really. <laughs> um, because our indoor spaces are really tropical spaces in terms of our of habitat and conditions, most native plants, um, it's not enough light and it's too much humidity and not enough airflow. So you can't, although you can start plants from seed indoors, which I'm doing right now, uh, I don't recommend growing native plants as full-grown perennial plants. You really do need an out, outdoor space for that. Hey, thank you for that answer. I'm going to launch our second question, and that is, can pollinators visit a balcony if you are 10 floors up or higher? So as I mentioned earlier, I live on the eighth floor of my building. Personally, I do get insects in the apartment, so I know at least where I live, it is possible, but I primarily have birds visiting my balcony and eating um, the bird seed and visiting. Okay, so, so far- Let's see, and look, what do people think? Yes, so far we are leaning in the category of yes, that pollinators can visit. 
more than 10 floors up. Okay, and I'll give a couple more seconds to get your answers in and then Ryan will weigh in on the topic. Okay, here I am. I'm back, folks. Oh, what's okay, this all about? Okay, you're about to find out. Um, okay. So, I'm just going to quickly mute myself and Hey, Ryan's just fixing his mic for the live demo. So we have six, sorry, 59% of you say yes. Um, the answer is yes, definitely. So we've had people up to the 19th floor actually indicating and showing us pictures of um, bees and other pollinators swarming up on their 19th floor. So that's pretty exciting stuff. Okay, and our last question, to test your knowledge, is can native plants live for multiple years in a container? And I guess the thinking is, Ryan, that if your plants are older, they might have longer roots? That's part of it for sure, yep, yep. And a lot of people, you know, are growing herbs and vegetables on their balconies and, uh, and they're annuals. So the question is, what about native plants? Are those also gonna be annuals or will they be perennials living multiple years? Okay, so we're leaning heavily in the yes category right now with more than 70% of you saying yes, that you can grow native plants for multiple years in a container. So I'll give you another few seconds to get your answers in if you want to vote. Okay, I'm just gonna share the results here. So we are with 71% say yes, 3% say no, and 27% of you say maybe. maybe. Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. And definitely, I'm about to tell you some of the techniques that I've learned over the past five years to, to get that from a maybe to a yes, all right? We're gonna get more of our plants to survive year round. Um, yeah, great. Thanks so much for participating in those lovely polls. It's so much fun to learn about what you guys think. Um, okay. So here we are. Might be wondering what this thing on my head is all about. So let's do a little switcheroo. By the way, how's my audio sounding? Is it, uh, is it windy, is it blustery, or sounding okay? Sounds great to me. Okay, good. So, dun -da -da ding ha ha! My external camera here will let you see um, what I'm seeing, which includes this container in front of me, because we're actually gonna plant a plant in a moment. But here you can see where I'm at. Um, so this is my spot in downtown Toronto and my garden here. I've got a bunch of these larger containers. Um, and then here's where my little storage shed over here. Where I've got materials that I'll be using to plant out even more stuff later on in the season. Um, and then I've got these great benches. So I'm sitting on one of these and here's the other. I built them with my mom who is in the audience right now. Hi mom. Um, and they're storage benches. So I, I store my materials and uh, my substrate and seeds and things under there. Um, okay, so I wanted to start off by doing that assessment of conditions. So as you can see, so this is west here and this is north. So um, sun is coming in now in the, in the afternoon, but definitely the brightest spot on my balcony is right here. I get the most light right about here. Um, and then this area over here is quite shady. So I make use of that actually with some of my containers. Um, water, I said water is a really important thing. Um, if you do get rain on your balcony, use it. So I also, again, from this corner all the way over to here, I get, when it rains, I get some water in on here. So those containers out there, I've put my plants that need a little bit of extra water and moisture out in that direction. Um, Sun, water, soil. I'll talk about that when we get to this container here and start planting. But again, me, really my philosophy for container gardens is to choose plants that don't really care so much about soil so you can grow them basically anywhere. Um, so that goes back to that idea of the alvar plants, the shoreline plants, the cliff plants, the bluffs, the shallow forests, all of that. Um, wind was another thing to consider. So yeah, I do, west facing, I get weather here sometimes. I get 
crazy weather. <laughs> and so you see that most of my plants do have um, more narrow leaves or divided leaves. So they can kind of, they're not gonna get um, ripped to shreds in the wind, which is something that I noticed um, was happening in previous years. Or if like this violet, they are a little bit um, more broad leaved, they're low. They're low to into the container. The other thing I do against wind is to plant my containers down a little bit. So you can see I have a lip on the edge of my container and that creates a little protective barrier. Hopefully you can see that. Um, and then I also mentioned that it's important to think about fauna uh, and connections to other creatures. So you may get birds, you may get squirrels or raccoons, depending on where you're at um, on your balcony. I don't get mammals, really. I did have a red-tailed hawk visit me once, which was very exciting. Um, but just something to keep in mind, how are creatures going to access your, your balcony? And here, by the way, you can maybe see my linden trees out there that are just starting to leaf out. And um, those are flowering trees that um, are visited by bees. And that's basically my bee ladder that gets my bees up here um, during the summertime. So that's, that's your sort of basic assessing conditions, apart from doing that light diagram, which all of you should be doing. Um, as That's your homework, folks. OK. Um, so I wanted to do a little demo and uh, show you how to plant a plant. Um, and well, so I've already filled this container. So I'll tell you how I did that. Um, this is actually a small container for me. Um, probably this one, I'm not going to consider this to be a year round container. Um, I like to stay in this size realm, which is about 40 centimeters across by 40 centimeters deep. I find that that works the best. By the way, I haven't mentioned this yet, but apart from this container here and this, this container here, all of these one, two, three, four, five containers, plus these little guys here. Um, I didn't plant those this year. Those are plants that came back from last year. They overwintered um, and I didn't even do any protection. I didn't put any kind of a tarp on them, put a little bit of mulch, um, that leaf mulch that I mentioned I take from the side of the road. But otherwise I did absolutely nothing. I, I've only just planted out these two containers. The rest of them are just freebies that came from last year. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, this container, as I say, it's on the borderline um, in terms of size, but it's what I've got right now. So we're gonna do it. The technique is still the same. Um, all your pots must have drainage at the bottom. So I'm not gonna flip this one upside down to show you, but it does have holes at the bottom. So when you water it, the water will go all the way through. Um, Secondly, filling it. So I use just uh, regular potting soil here. This is, you know, a combination of peat moss and perlite. You can see these little white things are called perlite, which is a, a mineral that improves um, drainage quality. Um, and I do mix in a small amount of solid fertilizer into the top third of my container. So I use worm castings or sometimes I will use composted manure to do this. And in a container this size, I just used one sort of heaping handful. So kind of this size. Uh, in a larger container like these ones, I would use um, about three of those handfuls. Yeah. So then once you get, once you get um, all filled up to here, you're gonna dig a hole for your plant. So here's, here's our pot and here's our wonderful in the zone sticker. This plant, by the way, is a um, Penstemon digitalis. So that is called foxglove beard tongue. Okay, and you can see this one, I got a bonus plant here. So there's the one main one here and then the little baby over here, pretty cool. Um, so you wanna dig a hole that's about the size of this pot. So I'm gonna put this one right here and dig to get in there. Just moving the soil over to the side and also sort of pressing it up against the side because I don't want the roots touching right on the side of the container. Although they can, in this case, I'd like to avoid it. Okay, let's see, will that fit in there? Just about right, we'll be fine. So that's pretty good. 
now we have to get this plant out of here. So the way that I do that is I put one hand over top, so I'm holding it with one hand, and then I flip it upside down. And now I squeeze, I pinch gently, I tap, I shake, and there I just felt it fall into my hand. So I didn't have to pull or anything. I can now remove this and take a look at the roots. So let's take a look at these roots. Um, so there's really three things that you could possibly see at this stage. One is you might not see any roots and it'll be quite loose. If that's the case, then your plant is slightly underdeveloped, which is okay. The plant will still be fine. It will survive, but uh, it might just be a little bit slower. Um, the second thing that you could see is something close to this, uh, which is a few roots on the outside, but um, they're not really wrapping all the way around. And in that case, you're good to go. The third thing, and this one is starting to get there, is if the plant was in the container for a little too long, then the roots start to wrap around um, like this. And in that case, it will actually be preventing itself from growing roots laterally. So what you're going to need to do before putting it in the ground uh, in your container is to break that up a bit. So what I do is I take my thumbs like this and I just gently tug. Okay, a little bit at a time on each of these four sides. And that's all I need for this one. It's now loose and good. So gently just pulling that and that's enough. Don't, I'm not gonna mess with it any more than that. So right into the hole, fill those gaps with the soil that you've moved aside previously. Good. And now I like to get my hands around it like this and press, press down with some force. Okay. And then the last thing that you do, you're not done until you water the plant. So you need to water your plant whenever you transplant them. Um, and that's so that the roots will get connected in with the soil underneath. Um, and if, if you have dry roots, that is the number one reason that your plants are going to die because dry roots mean, essentially it's like getting a bubble in your blood system. Um, that's what can happen. The bubbles can get inside of their vascular system, which transports water and that is not good. So we're gonna water thoroughly here. I have, by the way, this little guy, um, is a little transplant of sweetgrass that I took from my other container over there. Just took my gardening knife, tore out a little piece of it because it was starting to spread like crazy. Stuck it in here and uh, and it's gonna do just fine. It's gonna start and create its whole a whole plant of its own. All right, so that's that, so easy. Now in this container, uh, you could fit probably two or three more plants like that, but I don't have any more. So that's, that's the end of that <laughs> for now. Okay, so we're done with that demo. Um, how about Emily, have we got any questions coming in? Should we take one? Yeah, we do have some questions coming in. I have one from Jess who says that they're living in downtown Toronto. And if you have any recommendations for nurseries or garden centers that sell native plants. Yes, I'll just flip this back around to me here. That's a great question. So if you wanna get those highest quality native plants available, um, you, you have a few options. So one is in downtown Toronto. Um, unfortunately, because we're in the middle of a coronavirus pandemic, a lot of these places are closed, but let's just pretend that that wasn't happening for a minute. <laughs> um, there is uh, the Evergreen Brickworks Garden Market, they sell good native plants, very high quality. Um, Fiesta Farms up near Witchwood Barns also does some um, high quality native plants for sure. Um, we also have, so our native plants with those tags are going to be rolling out in um, Loblaws Garden Centers across the GTA and Southern Ontario. Um, that's happening soon. <laughs> so stay tuned for, to learn more about exactly where and when that's happening. I promise it's happening soon, soon people. Um, very exciting stuff. Uh, so those are great options and there are, there are a couple of others available but th that's a good place to get started for sure. Great and now we have a question from Mike 
who says that his sister has some farmland with forests attached where they have may apples and trilliums and he wants to know if he can tr transplant a few of those to his property or to his garden. Ah, okay, transplanting from the adjacent natural area. Well, okay, here's the thing. So if it's, if it's public land, you really should be getting permits before you dig. Um, now, hi. In certain cases, hmm, I don't know what I could really say here without getting myself in trouble. So I would say leave it, leave it where it is and please buy native plants from a reputable source to bolster those populations. Those plants may spread onto your property and once they're on your property, they're really yours to do with um, as you wish. But um, please keep in mind the health and vigor of those wild populations. The last thing that we wanna do in this program is um, endanger wild populations so that we can benefit in our personal gardens. That's not what this is about. We're trying to grow biodiversity. So please, 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 by all means, keep that in mind whenever you're thinking about um, wild plant sources. All right, Ryan, Mike um, added a clarification that the plants are on his sister's property, so not the public. Okay, property. so then you just need permission from your sister technically. And then what I would say is when I was a, I used to do seed collecting um, from wild sources with permits, and we would never take more than 10% of the entire population. And for seeds, we would also never take more than 10% of a plant. Um, so leaving lots of seeds in the wild to keep that population healthy. So keep that in mind. If I, so for that reason, I would say if there's fewer than 10 plants, then please leave it alone. Um, and if there's, you know, hundreds of plants, maybe you could consider taking a small number and probably the best time to do that, not that I'm encouraging you to do that, but would be the fall. <laughs> okay, next question, please. <laughs> okay, awesome. Can you tell us anything about rooftop gardens and beehives? Oh, beehives. Okay, so first of all, okay, so rooftop gardens, absolutely. Um, I would take the shallow soil alvar model, and basically I would try to grow an alvar if I had a rooftop. Um, I would do it in shallow soil and gravel, and I would grow a heck of a ton of prairie smoke and wild columbine and um, harebell and wild strawberry and all kinds of things. I would just go nuts and it would be fantastic. Um, in terms of beehives, let's talk about honeybees. Okay, honeybees folks um, are not native species. So they're basically little flying domesticated cows that produce honey and wax for us, which are wonderful resources that I love and, and use all the time for various different things but it's not the same thing as a wild bee and for that reason although honeybees are declining for a variety of reasons they're not endangered in the same way that wild pollinators are endangered by habitat loss okay so when we're talking about the native plant garden i have had honeybees up here and I'm cool with that. I, I saw honeybees and bumblebees sharing the same flower, getting their nectar, doing their thing. Cool, wonderful, great. Um, but I'm all about biodiversity. And so I wanna support hundreds of species of bees, not just one. Um, and so personally, beekeeping is not my thing that I'm into. And if you are a beekeeper, or if you're thinking about becoming a beekeeper, I would highly encourage that you think about the other bees too. The other, there's 360 species of wild bees that live in Toronto alone. Um, over 500 species across Canada. And um, I would like you to think about those species too and how are you gonna be supporting those? Great, and this is a really interesting question. If you are somebody who moves around a few, every few months, say you're in school and you have your container gardens, can you take them with you? Are they portable? <sighs> That's such a great question uh, because I specifically do use containers that have handles on them. You may have noticed that. So I'll flip my camera back around here so you can see. Um, boom. So these ones here, can you see this container here with the, the handles? So I can lift that up and my cloth containers also have handles on them. They're quite heavy um, and I use that mostly for uh, shifting them from one place to another. But 
what I can do is lift them gently onto a dolly and then I can um, move them that way into the elevator. I have taken my garden for a walk once. I put it in a wagon and brought it up to the park and let people um, make of that what they will. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you can definitely do it in that way for sure. Um, do, do just keep in mind the weight of the whole thing. And when you're moving it, maybe consider um, leaving it to dry out a little bit because the weight will decrease significantly um, for transit and then you can water it when you get to your new spot. But yes, it's definitely possible to do. Great question. Oh, and that also just reminded me thinking of water. I wanted to show you my bamboo rods and what I do with bamboo. So let's pull this guy over here. So you can see this bamboo rod here. And if I pull that up, um, here's my little bamboo. And you can see that it's uh, the color changes as you go down. And this moist area here indicates to me that there is moisture in the soil. So um, this is my little hyd hydrometer slash dipstick. And I move it every time I take it out. I put it in a different spot. Um, and I have one of those in each of my containers. And that's my, that's my way of telling. Um, what the moisture is at depth. And I find it really, really useful in that way. So I do recommend that strategy. Okay, let's take another question. Sure. Um, so this one is, can milkweed grow in containers? <gasps> oh my gosh, great question. Wonderful question. And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I highly recommend swamp milkweed myself. Um, I have some in one of these containers. I think it's I think it's this guy here. Um, milkweed is a little bit late in, oh no, I transplanted it to my community garden plot, so I don't have it anymore. But I actually started mil uh, swamp milkweed from seed. It took three years to flower, um, but it did bloom and I got the seeds and I've even grown the seeds now. So my, my, um, my swamp milkweeds have had babies, which is very cute. And um, I love milkweeds because Although I don't get butterflies up here, they're not quite brave enough to come up to my windy sixth floor balcony. Um, I do get lots of bees and the bees love the swamp milkweed. They go crazy for it all through the summer. Um, I've seen like four or five bees on one flower cluster before. It's really amazing. So yes, definitely. I think that uh, common milkweed would also do, but it's got those broad leaves. So keep in mind if you've got um, windy conditions. And I do think you could do butterfly milkweed as well. It's a little bit of a fiddlier plant, but um, you could give it a go. It likes dry conditions. I'm gonna zoom in here on one of my containers so you can see what I have going on. So let's, let's just try this. Emily, maybe you'll let me know if I need to pan up or down or can you see this pretty well? Yeah, I can see it pretty well. Okay, good. So this is my woodland container. This is where, to me, each container is a little experiment where I get to try something new. Um, and this is one of the ones that I've had for three years now. And these plants have come back three years in a row. So I've got zigzag goldenrod here. This is the leftover stem from last year because some insects will either uh, burrow into the stems and overwinter like that, or they'll lay eggs in the stems and then the, the young will hatch in the new year in the spring and come out. So I always like to leave the stems. Um, so that's my zigzag over here. And it actually spread, it spread down to here, it spread over here. So cool, wonderful, I love that. Um, here's my woodland strawberry, which I got fruits from last year, which is amazing. It looks like it's gonna flower pretty soon. And it also spread. So I started here and I put out a little runner that ended up over in this area. So that's pretty cool. This is my plantain leaf sedge, which I love and is doing so well and flowering like the dickens. Um, so this is a really cool thing that starts going in early spring and you get these really cool little clusters that you can watch as they telescope out and then the female flowers are, are down here in the axles of this sort of barbershop pole of a flower stalk. Um, I did put a witch hazel which it looks like is actually about to break bud. How fascinating. That's the first time I've seen that. I'm really glad to see that. I didn't know if a shrub would do well in this container, but I put it in and I gave it a try and, and there we go. It seems to be doing well. Um, I also want to show you, if you can see uh, in this area, there are a whole bunch of little seedlings. Do you see that? 
little seedlings popping up here. And I, so I, as I said, I'd like to sprinkle seeds in the fall. I do a variety of things and I just kind of leave it up to natural selection to figure out who's gonna come up and who's gonna survive. Um, those could be weedy things, but they could also be interesting things. So I just leave them and wait until I can figure out what they are exactly. I also have seedlings coming up in this container and lots of seedlings coming up in this container here. Wow, tons and tons, which is great. Um, last thing about, oh, right, my, uh, this is my large leafed aster that I just put in last year and it's coming up, so glad to see that. And even a, a Canada anemone, lovely. Um, so woodland container, again, I'm trying to mimic nature. Um, and so this is my sort of shallow forest system. The, uh, the, the woodland plants that live in deep rich soils like uh, oh, hepatica and bloodroot and wild ginger, although I love them, um, they did not like this scenario and they did not survive for me, which is when I kind of tried to um, shift my focus towards plants that live in shallow forest ecosystems. But um, the thing to keep in mind about a forest is in the springtime, it's quite sunny because the canopy hasn't closed yet and um, you know the trees are still bare of leaves so that's why I put it in the sunny spot but then once my lindens come out and I start to see the trees are leafing out um, I will move this from the sunny part of my balcony over to the shady part and it will it will live out the rest of the summer in mostly shaded conditions and it does seem to like that. So that's, that, that's what that's all about. Okay, let's take another question. So we're actually hit three o'clock. So I'm gonna oh, put up some of just the resources that people can access. And okay, then we can great. go back to taking more questions for anyone who wants to stay on the line. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Let's do that. Okay, let's just get back into the presentation. Um, so, do you want to speak to any we'll of just, these, Brian? This is, yeah, so I could go really, really quickly for folks. This is what I used to do covering my containers. Um, it's, uh, that's a tarp. I basically put everything under there, jam it with leaves underneath. That works well, you can do that. And if you're just starting out, I do recommend it. Um, as I say, this year I didn't do it and my plants are happy and fine, but we also did have quite a mild winter. So I'm not quite ready to say that that's, fine and fair and well for everybody. Um, so I would say if you're gonna give this a try for your first time, do tarp it over. I tarp at the late October all the way through until mid-March and then I untarp in mid-March. So yeah, this is just to show you that you can do a rock garden with native plants. And um, some of these plants like this Houstonia, um, long leaf bluet are so gorgeous and beautiful. And in a larger garden context, this plant would get lost because it's only about this big. But in a container garden, you can get right up close to it. You can feature it in this rocky background. And that plant brought me so much joy for like three months straight of blooming. Um, and uh, yeah, so I totally recommend going for some of those delicate small things. Uh, next slide. Oh, this is just to show that one time uh, a, a Canada goldenrod colonized my balcony, which was really cool. And I documented its growth over the course of three months, only three months. It went from a seedling to a flowering plant to a fruiting plant that had thousands of seeds ready to go disperse elsewhere. What a friggin' crazy monster plant that thing is. Uh, a little bit scary, to be honest. I did end up pulling it because I didn't want it to take over everything. <laughs> Um, so here, we just got some resources. You've seen this from our previous webinars, perhaps. These are great books. If you read all of these books um, and did a book club or something like that, you'd be well on your way to understanding um, all the different aspects and perspectives around wildlife gardening. So definitely recommend. Um, we also have some websites. I use these websites on a daily or weekly basis to help me identify plants, uh, to learn more about um, our local flora and gardening and all sorts of different stuff, which kind of plants are good for certain kinds of pollinators, et cetera, et cetera. They're wonderful. And um, yeah, I, I'll just say too that, um, of course, you can register your garden at inthezonegardens.ca. You can even do this with a balcony container garden. And it helps us understand 
the cumulative impact of native plant gardens across the Carolinian zone and beyond. So please do consider it and you'll get access to free resources, these intense, in-depth garden guides that I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, so yes, I, I imp implore you all to go, go there and do that. And of course, more webinars coming up soon. Okay, thank you so much, Ryan. So everybody, we do have three more webinars coming up. You can sign up for them on our website and you can also watch previous webinars on our YouTube channel. Um, I know that many of you have to drop off the call. We are past three o'clock. So we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. And for those of you who still wanna stay on the line and hear Ryan answer some more questions, we will stay on until about, I think 3.30. Sure. And because we have a lot of questions coming in, <laughs> I have to tell right, you, this okay. is an exciting topic. Okay, cool. Um, Let's do it. And and by the way, folks, if you want me to focus in on any other particular aspect of the balcony that you saw, I'm happy to, there's like a story behind every one of these containers and every one of these plants. I could go on for ages and ages, but I'll take them as they come. Okay, how about that? <laughs> Perfect. I have a question from Burnaby, BC. Um, this person has a fourth floor balcony that's right in the flight path of hummingbirds. So oh, what are wow. some native plants that you can put there um, for the birds to stop by and Great idea. Um, really love that idea. And by the way, if I was out west, so the native plants of southern Ontario are quite um, similar but different from the ones out west. So you definitely want to pay attention to your local flora out west. And if I were you, I would be looking at alpine plants for sure, like um, plants that live up at high elevation, again, in those rocky, shallow soils. Um, and for hummingbirds in particular, um, my understanding is that hummingbirds really tune into red colored flowers. And they also like flowers that are sort of trumpet shaped and face sideways, um, particularly vining plants that, that crawl up a, a wall or a trellis that they can kind of get into um, sideways because of course they, they feed while they're still on the wing. They don't like to land because uh, they're busy, busy, busy. So those are the kinds of things that I would be thinking about. Red color, trumpet shaped flowers, sideways, maybe climbing up a trellis. Um, off the top of my head, I'm not coming up with a specific species, but do think about those things when you're considering it. Yeah. Okay, I'm just reading through the questions. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot. So what would you do with your planters in the winter? You mentioned you would tarp yep. them, Ryan. Yeah, so I've done two, two different kinds of things. I'll just flip around here again. Um, one is to collect, gather all of the containers together into one spot. Um, I do a burrito style. Um, tarping where I put the tarp underneath, I fold it over um, and then clip it to itself, stuffing the whole thing with leaves as well as insulation. So I've done that. Um, if you're in a particularly cold spot, I do recommend it. I think it, it's a system that works out really well. But as I said, gotta say, um, I did literally nothing this winter and I got all of this stuff coming back, which was kind of a shock and a surprise a, but a wonderful surprise. And um, you can try that too. Um, if you do the larger containers, you'll have better success with that, I promise. Great, and now we have a question about wind and native plants. Yep. Um, so this person has plants they're growing on their balcony. It's pretty windy and um, the plants are starting to look a little bit limp. Is that because of the wind? It could be, it could be, yeah, some plants that are, less stiff, particularly, you know, plants that are adapted to a shoreline or a cliff ecosystem, they can handle wind. That's part of their natural conditions. But if they're meadow plants or woodland plants, probably strong winds are not in their general repertoire. So they may not have adaptations to deal with that. What you can do, and Emily, if you would go backwards in slides, a couple of slides, I'll show you the wind uh, screen that I put up. Um, if you go back, back, back 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 one more there you go okay so here uh one more forward uh sorry <laughs> um, okay so if you can see this black um screen that i put up 
So I had this up for about three years and it worked pretty well. Um, it's actually landscaping fabric that I just wove in between these railings here. Um, and that worked pretty darn well um, for about three years. And then the wind started to sort of blow holes in it and it got pretty ratty looking. So I took it down. And since then, I've kind of just embraced the fact that I have windy conditions. So again, I plant my plants low in the containers. I do lots of ground covery sort of plants, lower um, growing things. And then of the tall plants, I just do really, really tough ones that are um, have more flexible bendy leaves and that that works out really well. But it is something that you totally have to consider. Wind is part of your ecology if you're living on a cliff. So take it into account for sure. Okay, we have several questions about containers. Oh yeah. Um, what type of containers you use? Do your containers have holes? Um, yeah. Do containers yeah. get too hot for plants if they're made of plastic? Great question. And I did mean to cover this earlier and I didn't. So thank you for reminding me. Um, my containers that I've grown accustomed to that I really, really love are made out of this fabric material um, that actually is derived from recycled plastic water bottles. So the, the brand, they're called Root Pouch. And they're not paying me to say this, but I have put them, um, they're going to be available on our WWF Canada uh, online store very soon to be delivered directly to your house. Um, so if you check back on that website, you'll be able to order these containers in this exact size. And then you can follow my container gardening guide and you'll have everything you need to get going. Um, these don't have holes in them, remarkably. Because it's a fabric, um, the water sort of just transpires out the side and I find it's really, it just works really darn well. Um, otherwise I wouldn't have gotten so many of them. <laughs> so I do recommend that. Other materials that would work, you can do plastic. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about them heating up. Uh, they will get hot, that, that definitely does happen and you'll have to water them, but that's gonna have to happen anyways. Yes, you do need them to have drainage for sure. These guys are plastic. This is a kind of compostable plastic, which is working pretty well for me. Materials that I would avoid are metals uh, because plant roots do not like to be in contact with metal. I would avoid uh, clay pots like terracotta because those will crack in the winter when, the, when your soil expands, um, you'll crack your pots. So any kind of glazed clay, I would stay away from. Um, and then, yeah, so I have this kind of rubber one too that worked out really well for me. This thing, this rubber trug here, um, and I have another one here that I haven't planted out yet. Uh, those are just um, like baskets or kind of trugs for hauling stuff around, but I um, cut some holes in the bottom and I, they worked really well. This one, as I said, is newly planted this year, but um, previous to that I had my swamp milkweed in there, which lived there for three years and it was super happy. So yep, those are all good options. And Ryan, do you insulate your containers? Um, insulate in, in, so in the, in the growing season, no, they're just getting the full brunt of wind and sun and everything, um, which I think actually helps them, my plants grow quickly. Um, and then in the winter time, if I'm tarping down, I do fill the spaces in between with, um, with those, uh, the stuff from the yard waste bag. So the leaves and uh, twigs and any uh, clippings from the garden, I'll just jam them all in there. And that's my natural insulation for the winter. Yeah. Okay, and um, Anja would like to know, how do you manage your compostable plant material? Mm. Um, yeah, so I'll show you. So like this sweet grass in here, hopefully you can see my sweet grass container. This is my riverside container. So it's a little bit wetter of a container. I lined the inside with plastic so it would retain moisture. And you can see here, the sweet grass has been going a little bit crazy. So I've been pulling it, I chew on it because it's yummy tasting. And, and then I just sort of toss it in here as mulch. Um, this one too. I've just left the compostable material here and I just leave it there because that's what would happen in nature and it doesn't bother me at all. Um, here's another example 
of these are um, yellow giant hyssop stems from last year that are just dried and I just left them. And insects may use that as habitat, um, either burrowing in there or, uh, or um, decomposers. Various types of beetles or other insects may be living in my containers or spiders, which eat lots of nasty flies and mosquitoes and stuff. So I love spiders, I'm really into them. Um, and they may live in that. So uh, that's one option. Another one would just be to have a yard waste bag that where you're collecting some of that material um, throughout the year and then you use it at the end of the year for your, um, your insulation. Now I have to show you folks, I have to show you my first flower of the year, I just noticed it, is right here, a violet. This is a common blue violet. Are you able to see it, Emily? A little bit. What if I come in a little bit more? Oh yeah, I can see it nice. now. So that's just about to bloom. Beginning of May is the start of my season. So that's really exciting. Hooray. Um, yeah. Incredible. Okay, let's, let's take some more questions. Sure. Um, so someone said that they live in a condo that faces northeast and is a little bit covered by their upstairs neighbor's balcony. So there's not a lot of direct sunlight. Um, yep. So they have glass translucent walls or barriers, um, I guess their balcony railing, and they want to get started this year. So do you have suggestions for any type of herbs that would thrive in this environment? Oh, herbs. Okay. Um, so herbs that do well in containers in the shade. It's a tall order, but we can do it. Um, cilantro you could do, wild chives you could do, parsley you could do. Those are some good options, I would say. But um, also grow some ferns. Why not try some ferns? So um, ferns do well in shady conditions. Um, and the one thing is they like to have moisture. So I would do like, like I did with my Riverside container, I showed you, um, I lined the inside of it with plastic so that it would actually retain more moisture. Uh, you could definitely get some ferns going for sure. Um, and if it's not too windy, certain of the, uh, the, like the zigzag goldenrod, the plantain leaf sedge, wild strawberry would, would grow in those kind of conditions as well, for sure. Yeah, Great. give it a go. And um, are you worried at all about the weight load of your balcony? Ah, um, so good question. I did look this up and you should all look this up too or talk to your condo manager. Um, so my containers, the substrate is actually very light. Um, I mixed in gravel with some of mine, which made it heavier. But in general, it's, they're really light. Most of the weight actually comes from water when they're filling up with water. But I calculated it once and all of my containers together don't weigh as much as one barbecue and propane tank. So, and I know that other people have barbecues and propane tanks out there with a lot more furniture than I have too. So um, it's not something that I personally had to worry about, but you will, um, be, I encourage you to look into your building codes. Your balconies may not be built the same way that mine are. So it's something to consider for sure. Um, think about the, the dry weight and the wet weight of your containers. You might not be able to go quite as hardcore as I, I did. But I'll say that also my containers, those fabric pots, the root pouches are as light as you can possibly get. Um, so that's also saving me uh, in terms of my weight capacity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got anything else? I see 67 questions. Oh, yes, oh, there are many questions. <laughs> I'm trying to look through ones that I think would be relevant to like everybody on, on today. Yeah, um, yeah. We can do, by the way, folks, if, if we don't get to your question today, we will make every effort to answer it in the future, whether that's in the form mm -hmm. of uh, a session where I just go through one at a time, kind of like this, and just go question, 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 mm -hmm. and answer as many of them as I can. Or we might do it in a written form, but we will do our very best to get to every single one. Great. So this is um, a detailed question. Um, so it relates to transplant transplanting um, from the garden into planters. Yes. Um, Tanny's undergoing a major renovation at their house. So their existing garden bed is going to be gone, but they want to save the plants and then put them back into the garden next year. Yeah, yeah, containers are great for this. Actually, 
um, you can think of some containers as like storage gardens <laughs> where you can just ha have your plants there temporarily while they're in transit between one place and another. Um, the best times to do transplanting are in the spring and the fall. So like now is okay. Um, when you're transplanting from a garden bed, take a large amount of soil, like more than you think you need around the plant and do try to go deep too, because that soil is actually a major resource and you want to transport that into your pot too. Um, the other thing is, remember what I said about roots. So you want to make sure that the roots are never getting dry and are never exposed to air for very long at all. No more than like a few seconds to a minute maximum. So have your container ready, have your water ready, get your shovel in there, dig your plant, put it in the container and then water, water very thoroughly and keep an eye on those plants over the next couple of days. They probably will, you'll see some wilting, um, but it's likely that they will recover over time. Of course, it depends on the species and conditions and various things, but that's, that's what I would recommend if you're trying to do something like that. Great. Um, and we've talked a bit about balconies and shade. If you have a balcony that's exposed or you're using a rooftop and there's a lot of sun, how do you yeah. protect your plants and trees? I wouldn't. <laughs> I would just grow plants that love to be in the sun. So those alvar plants, if you've never visited an alvar, and by the way, alvars are a globally rare ecosystem, but 75% of all alvars in the world are right here in Ontario. So plants like this, uh, oh, I'll show you my prairie smoke, which are abundant on alvars. Um, they just get hammered with light all day, every day. And that's their niche. That's how they survive. They just, they're into it. This is my prairie smoke flowers. They're very adorable. Yeah, Ryan, do you want to switch back to your headset? Maybe everyone's seeing the slides right now. So your, oh. your view is really little. So I can stop sharing if you're ready to switch back. Oh to yeah, sure, sure, camera. sure, yep. There we go. go. And I will just pin that. Okay, here's my, my prairie smoke again. If you can see that, hopefully, maybe. Anyway, so that's one of those plants. Wild columbine again, another one of those. Um, lots of different species that just love to be hammered by light all the time. So that's what I would do. It's always easier to work with the conditions that you have rather than to try to modify your conditions in some significant way so that you can grow a particular type of plant course you can do that um, but it's just it's going to be labor intensive and it's going to require a lot of upkeep and maintenance to get it like that so I prefer to work with the conditions that I have and make only subtle adjustments when necessary like I did again with this riverside pot I was able to adjust my conditions to make it a little bit moister than it actually is by lining the inside of that container with plastic. Cool. So we have a question from Doris. They're asking about a small spruce seedling they have on a container in their patio. It survived the winter but isn't thriving and it dropped a lot of needles. Are there any suggestions for how you could help it along? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, oh my gosh, a little spruce. That's so adorable. Um, oh, yo, yo. Yeah, conifers have been a little bit of a challenge for me. Um, they do have special soil stuff that they like. So um, in forests, of course, they, their roots interact with the roots of lots of other different kinds of plants and trees and fungi and bacteria. So maybe a container is not the best place for a spruce tree. Um, but what I would do is take a look at the, okay, so if it's really in, in a struggling situation, um, get a larger container ready, and then take a look at the roots. So dig it up, um, see how those roots are looking. Are they well-developed or, or kind of not? And then quickly transplant it to a larger container, water it in really thoroughly, and um, maybe that'll help you out. But I have to say, honestly, myself, um, conifers have always been a bit of a challenge. I find. So, so that's just something to note. Although I did say that I would try a white cedar because those things live on cliffs. Okay. Can we Great. take another so question? 
We'll take one more question. I think this is a really good question to end this on. Sure. Is there one showstopper plant that you would oh, yeah. recommend that people grow on their balcony? Okay, yeah. And, and this is regardless of where you are in the country. And if you just want one plant that's going to like make you feel like you can really do this thing and it'll just bring so much joy to your life. I got to say, it's wild columbine. Okay, so here, I'm going to bring this thing up. So here is a wild columbine plant. Hopefully you can see that. This one is a seedling. So it just popped up by all by itself. It comes up every year in a different container because it just seeds and, and drops all over. Um, and it, it will bloom in one year. The flowers look like this gorgeous um, pink and yellow crown shaped thing. They dangle. They're incredibly hardy um, and resilient plants. They can grow in full sun, full shade, uh, moist conditions, dry conditions, doesn't matter. They'll grow everywhere. <laughs> and I just love them. I, I find them so adorable. So that's what I would say. Um, if you can find it in a garden center, great. If you can find seeds that are locally sourced, um, that's another good way to start with wild columbine. Yeah, yeah, that's my recommendation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you to everybody who stayed online with us over time um, to answer your questions. Um, I want to remind everybody, we will be posting the recording of this online. It usually takes us about two days to get it up, but it will be on our YouTube channel. Um, and we would love to see everybody again on Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time for our webinar on how you can maintain your garden space. Yes, indeed. Thanks everybody for coming out. Thanks for your questions and happy gardening. You can do it. I believe in yes. you. All right. Bye everybody. <laughs> All right, we're taking off. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.